Yeah, Hello? He's always late. <laughs> Lauren, can you hear me? All right, excellent. Well, uh, welcome everyone. It's really great to see all of you here. Uh, and thanks for joining us to honor our esteemed colleague, John Savage. Um, uh, just a little background. Uh, many of you may remember that just two years ago, May 2017, we celebrated John's 50th year anniversary. And then one year after that, John actually officially retired. Uh, so this was last summer. <laughs> uh, and at that time, we thought about doing something like this, but we thought that it would be too soon. And that's why we decided to have it now. But notice that uh, we didn't call this uh, the last lecture or anything like that. Uh, and the reason is John is actually continuing to teach. In fact, this spring he's going to be teaching a cybersecurity and international relations course. And you have how many students? 187. 187 <laughs> students. <laughs> so it's really amazing. And in fact, last year he taught the uh, the computation theory course, right, 1010. Yeah. Uh, and he's very active in his scholarship, uh, attending all these talks and panels, writing, uh, writing uh, uh, papers and so on, doing all the things that he used to do in a very active way. Uh, and if anything, I would say that he has ramped up his activities since his <laughs> retirement. Uh, and in fact, uh, I was going to ask him to teach an overload course next semester if he's willing to do it. That'd be great. And with this pace, uh, I think he's going to be ready for promotion and tenure in the next few years. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm not going to go over John's CV and talk about all his accomplishments. Uh, I made this joke two years ago that his CV is thicker than my smartphone. <laughs> uh, and in the meantime, his CV got even thicker, and my smartphone got thinner, so <laughs> it's still accurate statement. Uh, but what I would like to highlight is John's range uh, in everything he did from research, service, and teaching. Uh, over the years, I think he has taught more than 15 different courses, uh, from nanocomputing to computer architecture to uh, even operating systems and, of course, cybersecurity, uh, all sorts of courses. Uh, in his research, exactly, you see the same thing. He taught uh, everything all the way from the very small, like nanocomputing, all the way uh, to the other side to things like cybersecurity and the implications of cybersecurity on the global internet. And you also see the same range uh, in his uh, service to the computer science department and Brown. Uh, he did everything. He acted as the department chair. He founded the industrial partners program. He served as the chair for the board of the faculty club. And also he chaired the faculty executive committee. And not only that, but whatever he did, he did with a significant commitment and passion. And you can see this in all the awards and recognitions that he has gotten over the years. So for many of these activities, in his scholarship and also for his service, he was recognized by significant awards. Uh, and that's great. So I'm going to turn it over to John, but the one final thing, I was looking at John's publications uh, recently, and I noticed a paper that he wrote in 1995. This was an ACM computing service. Do you remember the title? No. OK. So the title was, Will computer science become irrelevant? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I think we know the answer to that question now, but evidently at the time, John has some concerns about this particular question, and he was reflecting on the field and its future, and basically he was concerned about what will computer science become, and he was making strong recommendations so that the answer to this question is no, and in fact, uh, we want computer science to thrive. And the major recommendation that he made in that paper was that computer scientists should not only look at foundational computer science problems, but they should do outward looking work and try to solve practical problems, societal problems. And it seems that the community has followed John's advice. Not only that, but John himself followed his own advice. And that's why what brought us here to his recent work and his current talk about cybersecurity and its societal impacts. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank, Thank you, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. Thanks for coming. Uh, what I'm going to do today is look forward. I have been 
in this area of cybersecurity since uh, 2009 when I moved to the State Department to uh, take a position as the Jefferson Science Fellow. I chose to get a choice of department in which to work. I chose to work in the Cyber Affairs Office, which is in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. So that put me squarely into the intelligence community. Uh, I'm not going to dwell um, uh, too much on that, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is this, uh, my current view of cybersecurity and computer science. It presents to us a, what I call a societal grand challenge, and you'll see what I mean when I'm done, I hope. So we all know what cyberspace does for us and how it's transformed society. We also know that it's created a lot of new challenges. And um, in particular, we know that um, social media has been leveraged for influence campaigns. Uh, there are even senators, Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska, who has been focusing on technology addiction and he has identified the loneliness epidemic. And it's affecting uh, people who uh, live with their computers most of the time, they don't have family around them, sometimes they lapse into addiction and, and, and drugs and so forth. And the most important point I want to make is that our militaries are now deploying cyber weapons. That's new and it is potentially dangerous. So uh, we all know about our high-speed networks. How many of you knew that 99% of all the international traffic is carried on undersea cables? And that if you break a cable, it's going to take uh, months to years to replace it depending on where it is. We all know that uh, computing is ubiquitous, but I don't know, I wasn't aware that 55% of the world population is connected to the internet. We, have, we know of huge data stores, and in 15, 2015, there were 12, it said 12 zettabytes of information created. You all know what a byte is, and 10 to the 21 is the number of bytes in a zettabyte. And attached equipment. This is where things get very dangerous. Everything is being connected. President Obama gave a speech with this title on May 29th, pointing out that uh, cyber is both bane and blessing. And it launched an effort in various executive branches of the government to create cyber units. And the Cyber Affairs Office was created in 2009, a few months before I got there in August. Uh, I gave my first talk in April of 2010 while in the State Department to a general audience with this title. And what's interesting about that is that things looked uh, th threatening, but it was not terribly threatening. But what I'm going to talk about today is that cyber is not just hacking, it's not just fooling around. There are now a number of people, I'm going to give you a reports in a moment, that who say that cyber can represent an existential threat. Uh, and it's primarily because we don't understand cyber, we don't understand cyber weapons well enough, and they are very easy to use. So they the thing that concerns me the most is that cyber weapons can be used to trigger kinetic conflicts. And as a result, my, bo my bottom line is we need a whole of society approach. So we use computers for many things. We do language translation, we navigate, we use them for shopping, we have a new digitized economy now. We have so many small devices that are put on the internet We've identified that category as Internet of Things. We have social media platforms, and we've uh, created through this, these technologies business-to-business -business services. Uh, I'm giving you the, the big picture here first. Uh, free trade has flourished, and we, but we now have many global supply chains. You know about Brexit. As a consequence of Brexit, Toyota has a, uh, said that a factory they have in Scotland, they're going to shut it down because it can't be assured that they'll be able to uh, obtain parts in time because they practice just-in-time manufacturing. Kanban, right? Okay. Global wealth has expanded. And this is another statistic that I find very impressive. Extreme poverty from 81 to the present declined from 42% uh, of the world population to 9.1%. 9 
That includes 800 million Chinese who came out of extreme poverty since 2001. And the other thing that's striking is China, which has in real terms the second largest GDP, gross domestic product. In terms of purchasing power, it is, has the largest GDP. It's 20% larger than the American <coughs> GDP. So China is a clear competitor to the United States. Uh, you all know about uh, the hot technologies and people have gotten very excited about big data, about the fifth generation wireless communication, which is high speed bandwidth. Blockchain, how many of you know about blockchain? Okay, all of us do, right? Everybody's excited about blockchain. Um, we have high expectations for AI and machine learning, right? Uh, but uh, and when we use it for facial recognition, uh, we find that these systems can be easily de uh, deceived. Don Song, who's on the faculty at uh, Berkeley, came and gave a talk last fall in which she observed that the visualization system that they have developed was trained on street signs and then somebody took a few pieces of tape and put them on a stop sign. So the human had clearly had the outline of a stop sign. But to the visual recognition system, it looked like a 45 mile per hour sign at an intersection. So as you approach the intersection, if you were using this, uh, this visualization system, you might keep going straight through the intersection and uh, have an accident. We can produce using almost off-the-shelf tools uh, we can edit audio. In fact, Adobe has a product which allows you to take speech and it will segment it for you in terms of words. You can move the words around. There is a uh, Jordan Peele, who's a Obama impersonator, and he has, uh, someone took his speech and trained an AI system on the position of President Obama's mouth as he uttered words and made a fake video, which looks very realistic. So there are people worried now that this technology could create an international crisis. Uh, we have autonomous vehicles. You heard about this crash a few months ago of the Boeing 737 MAX off the in Indonesia. Uh, what happened is they, the Boeing put an uh, automatic system in there that is designed to check for stalls. When an aircraft is flying, the wing is curved, it's flat in the bottom, curved on top, and as the air passes over, it creates a little bit of a vacuum above the wing and keeps the air, airplane in the air. But if you're at a steep angle, the, that pressure difference doesn't occur and the aircraft will crash. Apparently there are sensors on the aircraft wing which were defaulty, giving a faulty reading to the system, and the system caused the plane to move, dive forward. And the aircraft apparently went through, I guess it was something like a couple of dozen attempts by the pilots to bring it back, and eventually it crashed. So there's an example of dangerous autonomous systems. But now we have laws, lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, these things are being discussed at the UN, and they create, but they create all kinds of problems for us. Uh, these technologies on the previous slide all reflect the degree of hype. The Gartner uh, consulting firm uh, has tried to capture this with this diagram. These are, this shows new technologies, it's triggered, people get very excited about it, and then the realization dawns on them and eventually you come out with, uh, on a plateau. But there's, this kind of phenomenon is a human phenomenon. In the early days of uh, the internet, there were people like John Perry Barlow who <clears throat> were making predictions and he said, governments of the industrial world, I come from cyberspace, the new home, uh, home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. Uh, some uh, dozen or so years later, we have this fellow, Lincoln Dahlberg, saying that uh, people are predicting that the internet is going to revolutionize democracy. But he warns that this doesn't follow uh, automatically. And of course, that's 
when we see what's happening in China with uh, their um, social credit system, you see that's clearly not the case. Uh, in January 2010, Secretary of State Clinton gave a talk at the museum on this topic, the Internet Freedom Agenda, uh, and she said that the U.S. supports a single internet and equal, with equal access for all and uh, free freedom of expression, association, participation with, between business and partnerships between business and civil society, etc. But then we had the Snowden revelations in 13. President Xi in 2015 at the uh, China's World Internet Conference introduced the concept of cyber sovereignty. And uh, he is claiming that states should have the right to control content within domestic content. The Europeans have introduced uh, the right to be forgotten. Are you all familiar with that term? Okay. Uh, the general data protection regulations uh, are now in force as of May of last uh, of this year. Uh, the Europeans are requiring that uh, countries that uh, businesses that collect information on European citizens have to protect it. And if they don't protect it properly, they can be fined with a fine up to four percent of their gross revenues. So. Uh, the U.S. now and, and other countries want data localization. They, if you're going to collect data in their citizens, they want it to reside in country. That's true of the Chinese and the Russians and uh, other nations. Uh, so we can ask ourselves, how is the U.S. government going to respond to the social media issues? Is it going to propose regulation? And should you have something to say about this? So let me go through quickly some of the threat landscape. Uh, first, we we have new kinds of theft of IDs, of funds, of data, intellectual property. Uh, Yahoo, uh, a few years back, announced that they had lost three billion user accounts. That's about half the population of the planet, right? Uh, the Office of Management Budget, uh, which collects government records lost uh, the SF-86 forms which are used, which people complete if they're going to have a security clearance. It must contain all kinds of personal information, even indiscretions that you've engaged in. Uh, if you've used drugs, you have to report that. Uh, and someone, it's now said to be the Chinese, stole this information. And we just heard the other day that Marriott lost records on 500 million guests. That information included their passport numbers. And that article, written by David Sanger and somebody else in the New York Times, said that uh, the US government has, is going to announce that the Chinese are creating a database that they're of information collected from Marriott and from insurance companies uh, so they, who knows what they're going to use those uh, database for? Whoops! I lost my video. John, you really shouldn't use classified slides. This is what happened. Is that right? <laughs> Somebody heard I was going to use classified side and they decided they were going to kill the video. <laughs> okay. So we have seen privacy violations. Uh, Tim uh, Edgar is here and he's written on surveillance. And surveillance has become intrusive. We have distributed denial of service attacks. They're not damaging, but they are very annoying. And we have uh, had an extensive theft of intellectual property getting to the point where the United States is, uh, wants to push back, is pushing back. And the most important thing here, though, is that property damage via the Internet is, a, is easy, relatively easy, and possible. Uh, 2010, it was discovered uh, that the U.S. and Israel were attacking the, an Iran nuclear refinement facility. We call that the Stuxnet attack. 
The Russian meddling occurred in 16. In 16, we also had Petya and a variant of that, not Petya, released. Uh, versions of ransom, ransomware. Wired Magazine has an extensive article on this in which they claim that the cost of this, of loss of business and so forth, was at least $10 billion. And this is just a, a sampling of the companies that were affected by this loss. Uh, it's so serious that a friend of mine says that she believes this should have been seen as our cyber Sputnik. Sputnik was this Russian satellite that was launched in 1957. Um, and it so shocked America that the government responded with a vast outpouring of funds, new organizations, the Advanced Research Projects Agency emerged as a consequence of that. And we, in our competition with China, they want to outdo us, ought to have, in my view, our own Sputnik. And then WannaCry is another piece of ransomware that emerged last year, which was very threatening. It was said to cost millions to billions. But the important thing was that some young fellow in England discovered a way to, he purchased a domain name, and apparently that was enough to stop the thing from propagating. Uh, but international tensions are building. How many of you have heard of the Thucydides trap? Just uh, two or three people, okay. It's named, it's coined by Graham Allison, who's at Harvard. He was the founding director of the Kennedy School. And Thucydides wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War. <coughs> and what Allison has observed is that, I mean, I think it was Thucydides himself who observed that this was a war between a dominant city-state, Sparta, and a rising city-state, Athens, and they went to war. So what Allison did is he looked back over the last 500 years of history to find peers of uh, times when there were peers of states that were competing, one rising, one dominant. He found 16 of those, and in three quarters of them they went to war. And he said it wasn't because either one of those two parties wanted conflict, but it was because uh, there was such tension that you had an accident that occurred, or there was a third party who intervened, and somehow that led to war. And he cites the First World War as a prime example of that kind of situation. He was interviewed recently on Bloomberg News concerning the situation with China. He just came back recently from China. He says that the relationship between our two countries is, very, is going to be extremely dangerous. And he emphasized the word extremely. He says to avoid conflict is going to require extreme imagination. So uh, if that should emerge, that scenario should emerge, uh, it won't be a small conflict, I don't think. Uh, tensions with Russia are on the rise. They seem to me to be bent on, they want their great power status back again. You know that they meddled here in our elections, but you may not know that they've been boasting about the new weapons they developed, including an undersea nuclear tip drone. And I don't know why they are telling us this, whether they want to, they're just rattling their sabers or what, but it certainly is uh, ominous. Uh, there's an organization, a think tank in England called the Institute for International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, this summer they warned that unless U.S. and Russia <coughs> learn to cooperate, a nuclear catastrophe could occur. They, in fact, say that relations are, uh, quote, worse than they have been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. If you know anything about the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know that President Kennedy was contemplating the possibility of nuclear war with Russia. So we have those two issues here. And you know, you might say, ah, why should we be worried about this? You know, we've had 70 years of peace. Uh, we've got all these entanglements between our economies and those of our potential adversaries. The, the uh, Chinese and American economies are tied together. Uh, doesn't that eliminate the threat or reduce the threat of conflict? Well, 
you know, the Germans and the English were engaged in deep uh, commerce together before the First World War. So no, it doesn't. So I happened to hear the, you know, the BBC has a series of lectures that they give every year called the Wreath Lectures. And there's a woman who gave the lectures this year. It's five lectures. They're given at different, five different venues and public, uh, reported on the BBC World Service. And Professor Margaret Macmillan gave the lectures this year. She is on the faculty at Oxford University. And this is what she says. She says, we like to think of war as an aberration, as the breakdown of the normal state of peace. This is comforting but wrong. War is deeply woven into the history of human society. So, I, you know, you can ask the question, is conflict inevitable? Um, it could, is cyber conflict inevitable? And my point is, no, I don't think it's where you launch cyber weapons at each other. You know, software, here, have some software. Uh, I don't think this is particularly likely. But what I do think is likely is that cyber weapons can be used as a trigger for uh, the launch of other kinetic, standard kinetic weapons. I think it can lead to escalation. The political scientists have the concept of escalation dominance, which means that if you, once you start an, escalator, up an escalatory path, you can stop it. And uh, if you don't have escalation dominance, and which I don't think we have today because we don't understand these technologies, this is a place where the political scientists should come in, then uh, there, there is a risk of this happening. So this could be, a result could be an existential threat. Now you may say, well, uh, let me first explain what existential threats are. An existential threat is one that would, uh, could threaten your, your personal existence, but primarily, let's say, we're talking in terms of the existence of an organization of a nation, perhaps. So here are a couple of scenarios that I think could, uh, const could cr uh, constitute an existential threat. You seize control of a country's nuclear missile command and control center, or they have the impression that you have done that. And they find malware in your system, their system. They think it's meant to take control of the system. Uh, and so uh, tensions are high, and they ask themselves, uh, is this possible? Well, the Russians hacked the Ukraine electrical grid in December 2015. They took over the control center. The operator sitting at the consoles could see the cursor moving around the screen, landing on icons and clicking the icons. And what happened is every time they clicked on an icon, a switch was opened and current was turned off, voltage was turned off to a region of, uh, in Western Ukraine. They did the same in December 16. So they may see themselves in a use it or lose it situation, uh, which that was something we were guarding against in the early nuclear era. And that's why we created the triad, consisting of land-based missiles and silos, of bombers and uh, missiles and submarines. Another uh, type of threat is the electromagnetic pulse. How many of you have heard of that concept? Okay, so you know what it is, is it's for the rest of you, it's when you have a, an event that generates a very strong, sharp, short, electromagnetic, pulse of electromagnetic energy. You can do that in several ways. In 1859, we had only telegraph operators. And you know how a telegraph works? You send dots and dashes. And how do you do that? You have a switch, it's called a key, and when you close it, it causes current to flow through a buzzer at a remote site. So your two wires go over to the buzzer. And uh, you can uh, transmit dots and dashes by the duration of the buzz. Well, in 1859, there was an, a solar flare hit the Earth head on. You may have seen pictures of the Earth with the, uh, the uh, sorry, the picture of the sun with the Earth in profile against it. It looks like a, a tiny dot. So if a solar flare emerges from the surface of the sun, which is uh, a burst of charged particles, 
For it to actually hit Earth head on would be highly improbable. But it did happen in 1859. It's called the Carrington event. And it induced such large currents in the telegraph wires that it set paper to, on fire on the desks of, of operators. It caused some of these uh, keys to melt. And because some of these uh, telegraph wires ran through forests, it was arcing to the ground and fires were started. Uh, about two years ago, I read in the paper that there was a solar flare that just missed the Earth. What could that do? Well, it could take out the global positioning system. It could induce currents on the Earth. It could turn out the lights in great portions of the United States. It turns out the Canadians are better prepared to handle uh, electromagnetic pulses because they're dealing with the aurora borealis. <laughs> Uh, there was also a 1962 atom bomb test in the North Pacific. The bomb was exploded outside the atmosphere uh, at a distance of about 900 miles from Hawaii. It burnt out a significant fraction of the streetlights in Oahu, destroyed a telephone uh, microwave station, and it drew our attention to the possibility of these threats. And when Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un were throwing uh, words back at each other, the, the North Koreans announced that they had an EMP weapon. So what is an EMP weapon that they might have? It's nothing more than a nuclear weapon, nuclear uh, weapon that's ex that you explode outside the atmosphere. Um, you don't need to get the, the, uh, the weapon through the atmosphere. So you don't need, need to have advanced Snow, uh, nose cone technologies. So we could, with an electromagnetic pulse that uh, was launched by a nuclear weapon sitting, let's say, over Chicago, you could destroy basically all the electronics in the country. You could uh, disable the electrical grid and uh, possibly take out GPS, but you'd have to do that uh, close to the GPS satellites. So I'm going to give you a couple of quotes attributed to these two gentlemen who were on a EMP commission that was funded by the US government and they gave this testimony to the House of Representatives in uh, October of last year. The empirical basis for the threat of an EMP attack to the electrical grids and other critical infrastructures is far deeper and broader than the data for cyber attacks or sabotage. All right, the second, we recommend that the president declare that EMP or cyber attacks that black out or threaten to black out the national electrical grid constitute the use of weapons of mass destruction to justify preemptive or retaliatory responses by the United States using all possible means, including nuclear weapons. So you can see they consider EMP attack to be very serious. I'm now going to quote from two very recent reports. This one appeared about a month ago. Its uh, short name is the Moonshot Report. It was drafted by the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. And they say the scale and severity and complexity of the cybersecurity threat now poses an existential threat to the future of the nation. The cybersecurity threat poses an existential risk of the nation, okay? Demanding the exploration of a fundamentally new approach to identify, identify bolder solutions for a more enduring, defensible, and safe internet. This appeared in September, published by the Nuclear Threat Initiative. The foreword was authored by a number of people, including Senator, former Senator Sam Nunn. Cyber threats to nuclear weapons increase the risk of use as a result of false warnings or miscalculation increase the risk of unauthorized use of a nuclear weapon and could undermine confidence in the nuclear deterrent affecting a strategic stability. Serious stuff. And here's one from Rand about AI. AI, who would have thought of AI as a nuclear threat? But they say in this report Russia and China appear to believe that the United States is attempting to leverage AI 
to threaten the survivability of their strategic nuclear forces. That means, A, they say in the report, AI, they think, can be used to find uh, land-based missiles and therefore make them easier to attack. So, here's the problem. We can't, as computer scientists, secure cyberspace alone. Let's be honest. Uh, hardware and software errors, we're discovering them all the time. They're always going to exist. Uh, users can be tricked with social engineering. You can be uh, people who leave uh, uh, flash drives, USB drives in the parking lot, proverbial parking lot. You pick them up and stick them into your computer hoping that you'll identify the owner and can return it to them. Uh, and as with all types of security, it requires continuous attention. And this is my most important point because it's the only bullet that's in red. <laughs> okay. And uh, humans have important cognitive limitations. Think about that for a minute. Humans have important cognitive limitations. Biologists tell us that we have, have, are no different from our ancestors 70,000 years ago. So I love telling this story. 70,000 years ago, how did you ask yourself, how did our ancestors live? And what kind of survival knowledge do they need? What kind of decision-making capabilities were essential back then? Uh, and, you know, did they have to worry about uh, the results of making a decision two or three, not two or three, but say three or four steps away or further? I don't think so. Do we? If uh, four steps away, there's somebody with a, his or her finger on a nuclear uh, weapon release? Uh, I think so. So we exhibit cognitive biases and make decisions poorly. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. And it's we who control nuclear weapons. So how do you cope with this, these cognitive limitations? I think what you do is you bring lots of people who have many different interests, many different backgrounds. Uh, you know, what backgrounds would you bring to bear on this? Uh, well, you, first of all, I get to the individuals. You know, we, who is involved? Organizations, businesses, governments, all kinds of governments are involved. We're, we're, having, we're talking about smart cities, aren't we? Okay, uh, you've got to involve cities and towns. Can cities and towns be trusted to manage all that? Uh, computer technology that they're going to install today? And the answer is probably no. We do have a number of non-governmental organizations. They play valuable roles. We have belong to professional organizations. They can help. We academics can help. Uh, we have a critical infrastructure areas on which we should focus, like the delivery of power, water, transportation. Uh, these typically, these tend to be, especially uh, power, electricity, will suffer from cascading failure. How many of you have lived through these outages on the East Coast where the lights went out? All the way from Montreal down to New Jersey, I think it was, right? I've lived through a couple of those. Uh, it illustrates cascading failure. It's been pointed out to me that the pharmaceutical industry is now heavily automated. So if someone is able to hack into the pharmaceutical industry, they may actually uh, be able to tamper with the drugs that are going to be put on the market, and that would constitute a threat. How about agriculture? Someone else pointed out to me that we have a lot of gen uh, genetically modified foods out there, and this means that they, we have databases that are used to uh, uh, produce the seeds, and you tamper with that, you can have a long-term effect. And then there is encrypted data, which I'll say more about. Here, in my opinion, are professions, all of whom could help. What's going on? <laughs> all of, yeah, thank you. Uh, all of whom could help cope with uh, this uh, problem. So what can we do? Well, we can bring more security into the curriculum. Uh, we can improve hardware security. We can deploy secure software development methods uh, if you memory use, if you use memory managed languages, anybody know what that is? All of you should have your hands up here, the computer scientists. It means where you don't have to allocate memory yourself as you have to in the old, had to in the old languages like C. 
But uh, languages like Java are memory managed. Uh, you can avoid a lot of mistakes by doing that, just by doing that. How many of you have heard of segmented system architectures? Where you take your big complex of computers performing various functions and you uh, chop them into smaller enclaves and you protect each one of those. And then you can monitor the traffic, the normal traffic, that traverses from one enclave to another, and if you and then you observe, and if you find that the uh, when you're monitoring this traffic, that traffic is moving between two segments that it would not normally move between under normal operations, that's an indication that there's a bad guy in your system. And today, it's a, people operate under the assumption that there are two kinds of corporations: those that know they've been hacked and those that don't, okay? So instead of just defending, people are saying hunt. Hunt for the bad guy. Now we also have a problem with legacy code. That's old code written a long time ago that no one wants to rewrite. It's just too expensive. How do you address that? You could rewrite it or you could try to protect it from being hacked. How many of you have heard of address space layout randomization? Okay, many of you have. This, what this means is when you put your data, your operating system and all your files into the memory of a computer, you, we, uh, you um, can move it, you can put it, offset it from some particular point and you can move it around. That makes it harder if a bad guy wants to jump into some point in your code and run a piece of code that you've already had sitting there. It's okay, but it can be defeated. So the better way to do it is to speak to my colleague, our colleague, Vasilis Kamerlis, and ask him about code shuffling, okay? Where you take your code, chop it into functional pieces, and then all the pieces get reassigned so fast that even if you know the entire layout of the code, you know, all the instructions, uh, you don't have enough time to find the particular place that you want to attack in time before it moves. So it's a way of dealing with buggy software without rewriting it. It's just make it a moving target. Okay? So this, is, this raises another point. There are moving target defenses that you can uh, explore and use. I want to talk about the role that psychologists can play. So cognitive biases affect human decisions. Jim Anderson is here, he's uh, on the uh, psychology faculty, so he knows this. This is the authority bias. You have an authority figure who says something, you trust that person, just because that person is an authority. The availability heuristic, your answer to a question, a solution to a problem, is, is more likely to be something you've thought about recently than something that applies but is really hasn't been in your memory for a while. Ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? This is the case where uh, amateurs think they're more capable, they're better at doing something, and experts think they are less capable, okay? There is the divestiture, divestiture aversion. Uh, if you are manager of a baseball team and you've got a team, you know, got a shortstop, along comes the, the, the uh, scout who says, I found this fantastic shortstop, better than what we have today. Shall we hire him? The manager says, no. Why? It's because this is also known as the endowment bias. No, because I've already invested in this person. Why should I, etc. Well, Michael Lewis has written about is that the Oakland Athletics and how they use data to make better decisions, and that's a way of saying they wanted to factor out the cognitive biases that people had. How many of you have heard of super forecasters? These are people who are uh, much better at making forecasts than normal people. And the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency conducted a test, a four-year-long test, where they tried to identify teams who were better at forecasting than anybody else. And along came a team, it's, they call themselves the Good Judgment Project, and they were able to make 30% better decisions than people from the intelligence community who had access to classified information. Okay, so we can, we can uh, identify amongst us people who are, have superior abilities 
at making forecasts and who know how to take those cognitive biases and factor them out. Uh, what strategies can, can psychologists help us with to counter social engineering, to cope with fake news, to apply cognitive sciences to user interface and on help us with incident response training. It, when you have a, a, a facility, you run a facility, if you're not prepared for a crisis and you have one, you pay a tremendous price. It costs, can cost you millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars with some facilities. How can the economists help us? Well, I have a friend who came and gave a talk in this room to my class who was trained as an undergraduate as a computer scientist, and he began by saying, um, after the computer scientists had done what they could to make this system secure and failed, they needed to call people like me, okay, cyber economists, because they understand how, they have mechanisms to deal with issues such as breaches, ID thefts, espionage, etc. Uh, they can, uh, they understand what are called misaligned incenti incentives, with such as when a, uh, protectors are not charged for the violations, the, the security they're providing it doesn't work. There are information asymmetries. Uh, for example, you've got, uh, auto, you're selling, you have a market with used cars, and there are lemons in the market. In the old days, a lemon was a car produced by a typically an American automobile company that was so poorly assembled that during its entire lifetime it had problems. If in this market of good used cars you have lemon used cars, the price of all cars are going to drop to that of the lemons. Okay, so if you want to, uh, if you, how do you address that by providing better information to the market? Uh, externalities. You, an externality is you put a cost, push the cost out to someone else. So economists see the world differently than computer scientists, and it's bringing them into the picture that's going to help with address the security problems. How can a social scientist help? Well, they can assess the impact of the new technologies, uh, the effects of, on politics of the technologies, on culture. Uh, they can uh, uh, look at privacy and norms. Um, you think norms are important? What's a norm? Have you ever tried to formulate a norm? I went to three meetings on cyber norms at MIT when you were on the faculty, Rick. And at one of these meetings, we were discussing, uh, I guess it was one of the first, I didn't know what a norm was until I heard the discussion that I found myself writing down norms and I had eight or nine norms, and I read them out loud, and somebody there took notes, and we ended up writing a paper on that afterwards because she found them useful. But uh, when you don't have norms, when you, uh, when you uh, live by norms but are not aware of them, and you find people violating them, you suddenly realize how important they are. Now, there are others who can help us understand what the effect of artificial intelligence is going to be. There are many people worried that we're going to put people out of work, there'll be no alternative for them, and so we ought to be addressing that issue. Ethical issues that arise from computerizations, like mass surveillance, I mentioned lethal autonomous systems. Should we allow lethal autonomous systems to uh, kill people based on facial recognition systems? Uh, I mentioned the China's social credit system. Every person by 2020 is going to be in the system. They'll be given a thousand points, and then they'll, uh, if they uh, incur, uh, commit an infraction, that's going to be reduced. If their total point score stays below a thousand, they won't be able to buy a ticket on a high-speed train. Okay, uh, they're trying to change behavior by using this credit system. They have people who are out on the streets talking to citizens and recording information on them, et cetera. And when Google decided they wanted to go back into China, but they, to do that, they had to produce a, a search engine that uh, censored the uh, sites that could be reached, the employees at Google were quite upset. So ethical issues are now become important. We in computer science are teaching in that area. How many courses do we have? Three or four? Three? Okay. Uh, political, political scientists can help us with the formulation assessment and promulgation of norms. 
uh, a, at the UN, they had, a, was it uh, Tim, four or five committees, five, uh, that called the UN, uh, UN Government Group of Experts on Information Technology. The last one uh, ended without producing any uh, results, but one of them said that, in, that international law applies online as well as offline. That was considered an important advance. Microsoft is very interested in norms. They want governments not to uh, mess around with their software. They want uh, to see their fellow international computer vendors abide by certain norms. So they're out there playing play in this space. There was a whole series of meetings that were started in London uh, by foreign minister, I think it was, that rotated through a number of European states. It, there was, it's called the London Process. Now that's been made into a permanent activity located in the Netherlands. It's called the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace. And uh, another issue that which we could have uh, need some help is on cross-border cyber activity. We have uh, the Budapest Convention. It's been in force since, was it 2003 or four? This is, was put together by the Council on Europe. It provides a set of, of laws that if nations sign the treaty, they agree to uh, create at home in their home country, and then it's designed to facilitate interaction between countries. Uh, a, a legal authority in one country can call on a legal authority in another for help in resolving a case by and asking them to uh, freeze data, et cetera. Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is, uh, consists of Russia, China, and a number of former Soviet republics. And they are trying to create, a, we're trying to create an alternative to the Budapest Convention. They introduced their own international code of conduct for information security and brought that to the UN. It's still sitting there. Uh, political scientists can help us analyze offense, cyber offense, cyber defense, and deterrence. Many cyber attacks occur in what's called the gray zone, just below the use of force. Uh, we could use help in formulating cyber weapon, uh, weapons limitations agreements. If you think that someone were to implant software in your system and create a threat, and you would not want that, then maybe you should not do that yourself, okay? And so if you think in those terms, uh, you see that we, there's a lot of scope here for some intervention. Uh, deterrence of cyber attacks is a deucedly difficult problem. I've been sat through many meetings and nobody seems to come up with the perfect solution. Um, we, should, we could use some help in sponsoring commercial standards development. And we have a number of bodies, I won't go through what these acronyms mean, uh, there are also international governance models. Everybody knows about what bilateral negotiation means. Two nations get together. Multilateral, you understand. How many have had experience with multi-stakeholder governance? Okay, a few of you. And me too. And uh, Amer the American government loves multi-stakeholder governance because it sounds democratic. You bring together to the table, to the meeting, all of the stakeholders, government stakeholders, then uh, NGOs, the civil rights people, human, uh, uh, human rights people, the technologists. The only problem with multi-stakeholder governance is there are no rules generally to, uh, to uh, control the meetings. The Brown faculty, I chair the last task force on faculty governance, I think. Uh, I think it was the last one. Fac Brown is a multi-stakeholder faculty, but it operates under Robert's rules of order. It gives voice to the minorities, it allows for challenges, but if you look at some of the most recent incarnations of multi-stakeholder governance, you find that whoever chairs the meeting decides how, what decisions have been made, okay? So it's not, a, in my view, a safe way to, make, to govern, but we could use some help here. And the his role of history and culture on diplomacy is very important. Uh, China went through the century of shame, right? And you, ask, you can ask yourself, is that affecting their politics today? And there's no question that it is. 
So uh, other things we can learn from history and culture and so forth. So when did privacy become a recognized concept? Uh, Sean Canuck, who used to be the National Intelligence Officer for the United States government, sitting on the National Intelligence Council, said he thought it emerged with the Industrial Age. People were living up to that point in small communities. They trusted everybody in their community. They distrusted people in other communities. And now the, the big factory owners created these new con con uh, company towns, and they brought people from the many different villages together and so he was uh, arguing that perhaps that's a relatively recent concept. And you can ask, is in this uh, Facebook age, has it changed? What is sovereignty? Well, people like to say it started with the Treaty of Westphalia. That ended the Thirty Years' War. And if you will look at the conditions under which they met, they met for, I think, about four years. And they, the building in which they met uh, didn't have enough doors. And the participants were, uh, were in competition with one of those who could go in first, so they put more doors into the building. That, to me, is a, a way of saying they were, these discussions were bitter, bitter, bitter. Okay? So if we give up sovereignty, and this is something that I see happening, or potentially happening, in cyberspace, when you have the Justice Department saying to Microsoft, you've got data on your servers in Ireland, you must give it to us. And Microsoft says no. And it works its way all the way up to the Supreme Court before Congress passes a, the Cloud Act. But in any case, uh, sovereignty is easy to dismiss if it stands in the way of your getting your job done. Um, the current history on, effective history on current policy is an important issue. Uh, we can study globalization. Area studies, we, you can't negotiate with the Chinese and the Russians if you don't know their background, their cultures, etc. cetera. Uh, I sat through a cyber deterrence discussion on China back in August, and I was just shocked to see how subtle uh, some of the messaging is by the Chinese. And we don't use subtle. We use the hammer when we want to convey ideas. Okay, so in the management area, uh, area, there are a lot of things that can be done to help us make better decisions. Uh, we academics, we know what we do. We do scholarship, we uh, conduct research, we educate, we disseminate, and we serve as a bridge to the corporate world. Uh, I'm almost done. I have two or three slides left. I want to make a pitch for bringing technologists together with policymakers when it comes time to make policy. It's not always understood. This Computer Fraud and Abuse Act passed in 1986. was passed at a time when the Internet existed. It was only came into, it was called the Internet in, as of January 1, 1983, but no, no one had any real experience with it. And what it says is if someone enters your computer without your permission, it's a felony. Okay? And now you take your computer and you plug it into the internet, and somebody comes and finds that you left a file there unprotected, in other words, it's open to the world, and they can read it, and they take it, and they can be uh, fined, put, put in jail for a felonious act, okay? That doesn't sound right to me. This is an example of what Nick Lysison, who's a uh, Brown grad, works for Senator Congressman Langevin, likes to say, legislation by analogy. How many people are there in Congress, in the House, who are educated as computer scientists? Something like two or three. And how many staffers? The same uh, number, two or three. And yet they're having to cope with these, with these issues. So you should be consulting relevant experts. Anybody know the name Tom Nichols at the Naval War College? He wrote a book called The Death of Expertise, and uh, making a similar complaint as the one I'm making here. Uh, did you know that the Department of Defense has a law of war manual that they publish? It's readily available. They refer under the chapter on cyber weapons to the pre-emplacement of cyber weapons. In other words, that's legit as far as they're concerned. Isn't this potentially escalatory? I think so. So I think you, we ought to be discussing this with the political scientists. 
Uh, uh, the last topic I have is encryption. FBI couldn't unlock a phone uh, that it was owned by a San Bernardino attacker. So, wait a minute. So they asked Apple to unlock the phone. Apple says if we unlock it, we'll basically unlock all iPhones. So the FBI found another way in. But now the question arises is should vendors be required to provide backdoors? In the news this week, the Australian government has announced that they, the parliament is considering legislation that's going to require all providers who offer end-to-end -end encryption to provide access. It's not clear where that's going to end, but you can see this is clearly something that, on which we should all be interested. And where is the wisdom in this? I don't think it's in computer science. I think it's in other parts of the universe out there. So, um, just to finish, my grand challenge is today's cyber affects everything, all parts of society. We have wet cyber weapons, they're easy to use, they're not well understood, and their misuse can lead to existential crises. We are in an era similar to the early nuclear era. We did not know how to use nuclear weapons. And President Eisenhower put together, brought in his team of experts, they met in the solarium of the White House. That, that activity was called Project Solarium. And Mike Steinmetz was telling me that he learned that when he was at the Naval War College. And it's very well known in uh, security circles. Well, the last uh, national, uh, it was called the McCain Act, National Defense Authorization Act, which was just passed a few months back, has a requirement to create a cyberspace solarium commission. Senator Ben Sass in Nebraska, who's a very wise man, inserted this into the, the bill. It's now law. And their goal is to develop, he says you should develop strategic approach to predict, protecting the crucial advantages of the U.S. in cyberspace against the attempts of adversary to erode them. That's a nice objective, but in my opinion, it's not large enough. The problem is much bigger than this. It's really a multi-dimensional whole of society, requires a multi-dimensional whole of society effort. Thank you. So I was happy to see that the provost was here today because now I know he's going to go back to his office and he's going to start writing memos <laughs> to all these departments to say, come over and talk to us. Well, we actually have 15 new positions in CS, correct? And uh, uh, something like that, yeah. <laughs> 10 faculty and 5 lecturers. Yes. Yes. Ten, 10 faculty, 5 lecturers. And we are committed, are we not, to using some of these positions for joint appointments with other departments. That's accurate too, yes. Yes, and so, you know, my chair and my department have been way ahead of me on this. Okay, any questions? Or if I answer them all? Good. Okay. okay. Uh, so we have a reception right here. Uh, so I think we're gonna to move to the reception where we're gonna have